Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the twelfth episode of the story in which Naruto accomplished the impossible. You cannot stop the flow of time. Its will only rotates in one direction. A mere human cannot change that path. This story is from Dorsey, please support him, her. He, she is also a digital artist, so please visit his, her profile. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. <laughs> A strong hand stopped Rin from screaming by covering her mouth, another wrapped around her arms. One held her carefully against her kidnapper's chest, but somehow she could also feel fingers around her ankles. Rin's eyes suddenly swung open when the realization hit her, there were too many arms for one man. But the only thing she could see were shades of gold. She could feel the air racing around her as they tore through the night, but her sight was limited to the muscular chest of her kidnapper. She could feel his heart pounding wildly against her own, and she could hear his harsh breathing inches above her. Rin could also feel the chakra all throughout the air. It was wrapped around her like a warm blanket, soothing her own wildly drumming heart like a mother's soft touch. It felt utterly wrong in her situation. It was warm and soothing and she couldn't shake off the disturbing feeling that it felt too good in her state. This man was insanely powerful, too powerful for her to ever hope to face. How on earth could she have been so stupid? It was a stupid idea. Stupid, stupid, stupid. All of her tactics were counting on his slip, and it actually happened. But she shouldn't have froze up, she should have yelled she should have shrieked or done something to alert the others that something was terribly wrong. And she tried. Only Kami could tell how desperately she tried. But no one noticed that something went wrong. Both Jiraiya and Kakashi had been sleeping peacefully, unaware of her fate. Paralyzing fear swept through her, rendering her body useless. She was sure that Jiraiya was strong enough to beat him, and they were even in a place where they didn't have to worry too much about damages. The memory of a jutsu strong enough to annihilate an entire village was still prominent in her mind. But Jiraiya was peacefully snoring now, and after this, she doubted that the power of a Sanin would be enough to stop the blonde. She couldn't really understand the reasoning behind her own panic. Toraku had never showed any ill intent. He was always kind to everyone, the only exception being Gatu. And somehow when she couldn't puzzle out the connections, her mind reacted by the only way it could in that situation. By panic. Her sudden fear was a gut instinct made by her sheer confusion. She closed her eyes once more and tried to focus on a plan to free herself, but she could think of nothing as the warm chakra around her numbed her mind. Suddenly, they stopped. She couldn't feel the wind against her skin anymore, and everything was quiet around them as the man's harsh, rugged breathing assaulted the silence of the night. She had already recognized the symptoms, harsh breathing, tensed, inner muscles based on the whistling sound of his lungs despite the fact that the run would have been easy for a seasoned shinobi. The wildly pounding heart and the last wild glance he gave her reminded her of a cornered animal. It was pure panic, and panicking people had the tendency to be incredibly dangerous. The boy finally let her go, but only for a moment before a clone popped into existence and replaced the original to restrain her. The bunshin held her hands behind her back with one strong arm while the other was clapped on her mouth again. For the first time, Rin got the opportunity to have a good look at what all that gold was around her. But she really wished she couldn't see it. Golden chakra fluttered around his body like they were real flames, an inferno of pure energy. A long coat made from the same flaming power followed his footsteps, illuminating the forest line around them with its rich light, as the bond restlessly started pacing up and down the edge of the clearing, his hands grabbing his blonde locks in an attempt to channel down some of his emotions. Despite her situation, she was suddenly surprisingly calm. She already gave up the fight as soon she saw this form. This boy was too strong for her. There was no way she could free herself. This is not good. This is definitely not good, Naruto muttered and continued pacing. Shut up, he hissed, angrily this time. Shut up. 
A dangerous growl escaped from Naruto's lips, and he suddenly stopped moving. I said shut the hell up Kurama, the blonde roared into the silent night, and a group of birds shot up from their dreams to escape the wrath of a real demon. His always clean, cerulean eyes shot a glance at the shaking girl, and Rin violently flinched when she noticed the scarlet, slit-like irises. His breathing was still harsh, but his features moved from anger to shock as soon as he saw Rin's wide and terrified eyes. Hey, don't be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. Naruto made a hesitant step, but the girl desperately tried to struggle out from his clone's hands as a fresh wave of adrenaline rushed through her veins. The clone suddenly frozen behind Rin for a second, so did the girl as something shifted behind her. The presence, the aura and everything from the clone felt off and different from before. The Bunshin opened his mouth to talk behind her, but the voice was nothing like she had heard before from the blonde. A baritone boomed over the clearing, even if it wasn't louder than an annoyed mutter. Out of all of them, this was your stupidest idea by far, Naruto. The named blonde didn't answer, instead sinking to the ground and rubbing his face. I didn't think. I was panicking and, I'm sorry. I messed up again, he whispered. What do you want to do now? I don't know, Naruto muttered into his hands, still shrouding his swaying emotions on his face. After a long, tensed minute, the boy finally lowered his palms, and the flipping chakra fire gradually disappeared around him, leaving them in complete darkness beside the moon's faint, silver light. Another clone popped into existence and walked toward the nearest tree to settle down in a meditating position. Just seconds later, an orangish pattern appeared around the Bunshin's closed eyes. A dozen more replicas appeared beside the blonde and rushed into the dark forest when they saw the nod of the lonely clone at the tree. A minute later, another returned with a pile of wood, and soon, a small campfire was crackling in the middle of the forest. The original Naruto finally looked up from the ground and shot an annoyed glare to the clone behind the still frozen Rin. Don't antagonize my clones. You still haven't answered my question. What do you want to do now? I don't. No, Naruto growled as he folded his arms in front of his chest in a defensive manner. Tell her. No. Then kill her. What? No way. Naruto lunged up immediately, eyes wide with disbelief. The girl started to tremble once more in Kurama's strong arms. Strangely, the clone let out a relieved sigh. Deep down, Rin realized that it was some kind of a test, and the blonde had answered correctly. The tension in the Bunshin's muscles lessened in an instant, and his grip also became softer, however, not enough to free herself. Then your only option is to tell her everything, the clone stated in a hushed, low tone. Naruto didn't answer immediately. He instead averted his gaze from Rin's shaking form and sat down once more. His shoulders were stiff, and his whole posture screamed about the inner fight he was having with his own demons. She won't believe a word. Who would believe it? Then try to convince her. Naruto hesitated for a second, then slowly nodded in acceptance and raised his head to look into Rin's wide and frightened brown eyes. The arms around Rin finally released her, but her shaking muscles couldn't hold her weight. She started collapsing to the hard ground, and Kurama's arms shot out to grab her falling form. Rin swept her head toward the clone as soon she felt his touch on her skin. However, she wished she hadn't had that opportunity for the second time that night. Thick, ink-black whisker marks and animalistic, crimson slits greeted her instead of the well-known, fine features of the blonde. She glanced down to her forearm and immediately shook off the clawed hand. She crawled back from the being that previously had been holding her captive, but as soon as she realized that she was slowly inching closer and closer to its creator, she hopped to her feet. Her eyes were wild and haunted by the panic suddenly squeezing her heart, despite the previous conversation she could overhear. They wouldn't kill her. Calm down, Rinchen. I won't hurt you. Naruto's voice came out in a soothing manner, but it only unnerved the Kunoichi even more. 
She twisted her body and retreated from those searching and desperate blue eyes until her back hit a tree. Even with the hard contact, she didn't stop the desperate attempt to try merging with the bark. Only Rin's last bit of sanity restrained her from clawing a big hole in the hard surface for shelter. What are you? And what is that? Rin finally stuttered and raised a lean. Shaking finger toward the possessed clone. Humans, the fox muttered with a sullen grimace on his face, twisting Naruto's borrowed mouth to reveal his pointed canines. Hey! You're not helping you know. Naruto glowered in annoyance at the clone. He leaned closer but stopped when the girl stuck to the tree even more. Rinchen. Naruto exhaled softly and motioned to the still flustered fox. He is Kurama, the nine-tailed demon fox. What? Rin snapped her head toward the teenager this time. What do you mean by that? The Kyubi is sealed in Kushina. She is its Jinchuriki. As you already know, my name is Uzumaki Naruto. I'm the child of Uzumaki Kushina and Namike's Minato. I'm Kurama's Jinchuriki. Or I will be on the day I'm born. I'm from, from the future Rinchen. What? Rin repeated, her eyes still wide but more from confusion than fear. Naruto sucked in a long breath and started to talk. He didn't stop for long hours. He told everything that was weighing on his heart and shoulders. Gradually, Rin calmed down, but never kept from shooting a wary glance from time to time at the stoically standing Kurama. After the first long hour, Naruto's mouth became dry, but he still continued. There was too much to tell, there was too much weight to get rid of. Naruto's gaze was either focused on Rin or on the soft moss under him while speaking. He told her about his birth. About the Kyubi. His childhood. His days in the academy. The Uchiha massacre. About Irika and Kakashi Sensei. Even about the Scarecrow's perverted tendencies. He told her what Gata did in his timeline, and he talked about his first Chunin exam and the Sandame's death. How he learned the Raisingan and brought Tsunade back to Kanoha to become the Godame Hokage. About Sasuke's deflection. His training trip with Jiraiya. He told about Gara and Kakuzu. He told her how Jiraiya died. He spoke about his loss and how grateful he was to meet him once more. He told everything about Pain's attack, not leaving out any detail. And finally, Naruto told her about the Fourth Shinobi War, about a masked Uchiha and about Madara. Kurama's face relaxed inside his jailer as a disturbing presence slowly faded from Naruto's mind with every exhaled word. As the burden decreased on Naruto's heart and as his posture started to relax, the fox's mind calmed down with each sentence. The dark figure continued to vanish with one last, recognizable expression on his face. A final angry snarl bubbled out from his throat, before the mirage faded away. I told you I won't let it happen. Kurama shot a satisfied and cocky smirk where the image had been previously and finally averted his senses to the outside word. Rin interrupted Naruto from time to time with a well-aimed question, desperately trying to get a hold on the tail. She had no such luck. She struggled to convince herself that all of this was a lie, the over-imagination of an insane boy. Because there was no way Minato and Kushina would die on the night their child was born. There was no way someone would order a massacre on every living and breathing Uchiha. There was no way someone would be twisted and strong enough to unleash a zombie army on the world and shove every living person into a genjutsu by collecting the bijou. There was no way all of this could be real, was there? When Naruto finally reached the end of his tale, how he regained consciousness in a different era, how Kurama had subdued his memories to save him from an interrogation. The blonde stopped after a few minutes and fell into a silent state of apprehension. He didn't realize that his fingers were clenching his pants, waiting for the world to right itself. His azure eyes were desperate as he gazed at the girl in front of him. Nervously, he broke the suffocating silence that had descended on them, do you believe me? 
Rin furrowed her brows and shook her head. I, I don't know yet. But. So many things would finally make sense. The frown only deepened on Rin's fine features. I thought you were one of Orochimaru's experiments first. A clone with messed up DNA and a messed up memory. Why does everyone think I'm a clone? I'm the one who is always making clones, not the other way around, Naruto grumbled behind gritted teeth and folded his arms in front of his chest, a familiar pout on his face, but Rin ignored him and continued. When I first found Orochimaru's notes about the DNA test, everything was confusing, and all my theories were crazier and crazier. I never thought about the easiest thing, never just let myself believe that the test was correct and that you were actually Sensei's and Kushinison's child. But time travel. Rin shook her head. That, that's just crazy. You don't believe me, Naruto muttered with a low tone, his shoulders slumping. The Kunoichi watched the boy in front of herself for a second before she inched closer to his side. I didn't say I don't believe you. It's just that, give me some time. Will you do this for me? Naruto hesitantly nodded. Does anyone else know about this? I mean, about the DNA test? No. I stole the only evidence, and I didn't know to who I could have turned to for help. I didn't want to tell Sensei or Kushinison, and I also had to forgot the idea of telling Jiryazama or Kakashikan. And when I saw how you were handling Gatu, something snapped in me, and I couldn't hold it back. I had to do something. I wanted to know. I thought with knowing your real name I would understand why you were doing it. I thought if something went wrong, I'd just scream, but... Rin softly murmured. Then her eyes narrowed and she shot a suspicious glare at the blonde. Hey! Why didn't they wake up? Even if I couldn't scream, I was way too loud for them to have slept through it. I, I have a tendency to snore loud you know. Naruto scratched the back of his head with an embarrassed smile. So Jiraiya put up a privacy seal around their bed to filter the noise. Another silent section greeted them until the girl finally opened her mouth. Who was the masked man? Naruto didn't answer straight away. He looked up to his still-possessed clone for guidance behind the girl's back. Kurama narrowed his eyes while he thought about it for a moment but shrugged. It's someone I know? It was more a statement than a question. However, no answer came as Naruto was desperate to make the right decision. It's your choice when you want to tell, but you should tell it sooner or later. I'm running low on chakra. I'm leaving, Kurama said and turned toward the brunette for one last glance. Take care of that idiot from the outside. And don't let him play martyr anymore. He's shouldered enough burdens alone. Help him on this journey. Naruto was glaring daggers, but the fox ignored him. His gaze was locked on the kunoichi in front of him, patiently waiting for her answer. She finally nodded. I'll see what I can do. A wide grin spread across the clone's features, and the fearless demon fox gave a small, almost invisible bow. Naruto almost missed it, but it was still there. Thank you. It was a pleasure to finally meet you in person. The clone finally puffed out of existence after a short nod toward the frowning blonde. Why didn't you just tell them who you were from the beginning? Rin asked while turning to the blonde with a confused expression. His reasoning was lost on her. I wanted to, but Kurama told me it was a bad idea back then. So I hid everything. It was so hard, I wanted to shout out who I am but I gradually submit myself. But Orochimaru made that stupid test and then Shursue and Itachi, then Danzu, mom already knows I'm a Jinchuriki, and now you, and I, and now Kurama wants me to confess and open up. But the web of lies is too big now. I don't know where or how to start, how fix it and I'm, everything became so messed up, uncontrolled words rushed out from his lips. Naruto suddenly snapped his mouth shut and tensed, his gaze flickering to the edge of the thick forest, but only a clone returned with another pile of wood to feed their slowly fading campfire. In a minute, the clearing was filled again with the happy, 
crackling sound of life-giving flames. It gave warmth to their bodies and filled the clearing with a soft light of orange, red, and yellow that flickered on their figures from time to time, dancing amidst the shadows. The peaceful silence wasn't interrupted for several long minutes. It must be hard, knowing that you're so close to the parents you never had but still so far, Rin murmured softly, her gaze locked on the dancing flames. It is sometimes, Naruto admitted. No word was spoken for another stretch of time until the small campfire faded away from existence once again. Only the embers were left behind to illuminate the dark night with its fading light in the first week of July. Rin gradually raised herself and gave a helping hand to the blonde. Come, Toro Naruto. It's almost dawn. The others will freak out if they don't find us in our beds. The blonde hesitantly watched the offered hand but accepted it to rise to his feet. A soft smile spread across his fine features, and with the expression still on his face, he gently hugged the surprised girl. Thank you, Rinchen. For what? the girl murmured into Naruto's chest. For listening. Naruto shifted his grasp around the girl to pick her up, and soon, Rin found herself in his gentle arms, Naruto carrying her like a husband would do to his wife. Warm, golden chakra flickered to life, and the two shinobi were gone in a heartbeat. Where have you two been? Kakashi asked with a raised eyebrow, suspiciously observing the two shinobi in front of him. Rin chewed down on her lower lip for a minute to gather her thoughts. She glanced nervously to the fidgeting blonde at her side. We were talking. With that, Rin passed by Kakashi to gather her stuff and finally depart to Kanoha. It was a silent retreat, and the copycat knew that very well. Rin never could get rid of Kakashi's probing black eyes during their travel. The way back to Kanoha was awkward, as this time Naruto's back ached because of Kakashi's stabbing glare. They leisurely reached the gates and after dumping the still unconscious Gatu at the Uchiha police station, each of them retreated to their own accommodations, allowing the Toad Sage to make his report alone. Naruto's limbs were stiff from the long walk, but not in a disturbing way. It was more of a welcoming sensation for the Jinchuriki the same tiredness in his muscles after a long training session. He didn't even stop at the Hokage Tower to greet his father nor did he poke his head inside his mother's room. He went straight into his own and collapsed on the bed in his clothes to finally get his well-deserved sleep after the chaotic three weeks in wave. Kurama patiently waited for Naruto to finally drift into a deep sleep. His breathing relaxed and his heart rate lapsed into a slower, more peaceful rhythm. The jailer's thoughts also settled down, and his mind slowly emptied. In the next moment, his awareness sank into oblivion. The fox raised his enormous head from his paws while moving into a comfortable sitting position and closing his crimson eyes. His own mind cleared, and his own breathing also settled as he forced his body to move into a different state. Something shifted around him, and the next moment Karama opened his eyes, he was face to face with his bigger counterpart. Karama made a sliding glance and noted with a nod that this time he managed to reappear in a different void than Kushina's seal. Karama tilted his head to the side, letting a joint snap back to its proper place. The QB in front of him narrowed his enormous orbs as he watched his own smaller, future form suspiciously. What do you want now? boomed the QB in a threatening manner. His form raised from the void to look even bigger than his counterpart. Do you remember the night when Orochimaru died? Kurama asked in an indifferent tone. I do not remember unnecessary things. The Kyuubi's voice was both venomous and disdainful. That night was special. There was a disturbance in Kushina's seal. You remember now? I've never been able to disturb the seal in the last five years. This damn Uzumaki seal is too strong. But indeed, Perhaps I felt something, the QB admitted while he let out a yawn. On the night we fought with Orochimaru, I felt your hatred. It consumed Naruto's mind and even managed to corrupt my own. It must have come from you, Kurama protested. It wasn't from me. The disturbance you're talking about came from somewhere else entirely. 
Karama narrowed his eyes as he watched his counterpart. Then where did it come from? How should I know? The QB spat out in an annoyed tone. Karama didn't answer. He instead retreated back to his jailer after a short nod toward the QB. He made a glance toward the back of Naruto's mind, where for long weeks there was another dark presence. It did nothing else than rest his back against the rough trunk of a giant osier tree. The moss was black and dry on the spot the entity used to sit, and some of the enormous tree's lower branches were on the verge of dying. Even though it had finally disappeared, Kurama could still feel its faint, almost invisible pulsing left over under the surface. Lurking deep under the roots of the tree, it was almost unrecognizable, but it was still there. Waiting under the dark shadows to rise again when it got another opportunity. The fox narrowed his crimson eyes as his growl threatened to explode in a roar. It was your doing, you sick bastard. You were the one who disturbed our cooperation, not my counterpart. He spat out the words like they were sour venom. Unsurprisingly, no answer came. Karama couldn't shake the nudging feeling that the thing actually let out a long, derisory and mocking laughter under the roots. The brush danced between the experienced fingers on the surface of the fine scroll in front of Naruto. His hands made a waltz, and new symbols appeared on the outlined seal. It won't work this way, Jiraiya stated in an uncaring manner. However, his searching eyes gave lie to his previous indifferent tone. He carefully swept through the fine design of the seal once more and shook his head. It's completely unbalanced. If you're going to continue on this line, it's going to blow up. It won't, old man. Just stay out of my business. Naruto retorted. Still too arrogant to listen to some advice? I'm not. I'm not arrogant. Why does everyone said that? Jiraiya didn't answer for a long minute, the brush still on the spot where Naruto froze in his motion. The dry paper hungrily drank the ink into itself and the small black dot, slowly growing by each passing second until it finally reached a line before the blonde could notice it. A wide, smug smile spread across. Jiraiya's face as a final answer. I told you. The sage suddenly ducked under the table. Naruto couldn't do anything else except blink once before the pattern viciously flared, and in the next second, it dissolved into a pile of ash with a blinding flash. Black smoke filled Naruto's room together with Jiraiya's guffaws and coughing. The blonde stumbled toward his window to open it widely and finally get some breathable air. Jiraiya was on his heels, and another loud snicker bubbled out from his throat between two coughs as soon as he looked at his companion. Naruto was covered in the black grime from head to toe, only his annoyed, but still vibrant, blue eyes disturbing the scene. His golden locks were now ink black, and his white scara only outlined his flashing cerulean eyes on his black face. The annoyed grimace slowly disappeared from the once blonde's face, and his own laughter filled the room. Nah, could you help me finish this? A soft smile spread across Jiraiya's face, and the toad sage locked the blonde's head under his armpit and ruffled his hair, sending a big cloud of ash into the air. Naruto's swearing and bickering voice filled the large mansion for long minutes, but it soon turned into a laughter. Naruto gracefully jumped into the open window of the Hokage Tower. He watched his father's back as he leaned above a scroll, and he could feel the tension in his relative's muscles. Naruto hopped into the office and leisurely strolled to the man's side to peek over his shoulder and read into the document. His right brow raised in an instant. What's this? The new arrangement of the village council and the personal advisory body, Minato stated and leaned back in his seat to finally stretch his numb arms, not caring that he almost hit his brother in the head during the progress. Hey! Are you blind? It was hard enough to tolerate you while they healed your hearing. I don't want to endure a blind Hokage, Naruto teased, but Minato ignored him, simply leaning back to examine the document once more. Nah, are you upset or something? Naruto asked curiously while he suspiciously eyed the scroll under his father's hands. No. I'm actually satisfied. 
With Danza's deflection, I got an open position in the advisory body. There was a vote yesterday, and the chosen representative will be Hyuga Hayashi. See? I told you the next one would be either him or an Inazuka, Minato answered with a wide, smug smile on his face. Hayashi will be here any minute to officially accept the position. A soft knock interrupted Naruto's line of thoughts, and Rin entered the office with two Hyuga on her heels. Naruto suck in a breath as soon as he spotted the two identical men. The only difference between the twin brothers was the proudly shining Konoha headband on Hizashi's forehead. Rin retreated next to Naruto's side while the older brother made a slight bow. His cohort did the same, and the two stepped closer. Naruto watched the whole exchange. With a deep frown on his face, and it didn't go unnoticed by Rin. When the formalities were finally finished and both she and Naruto were silently walking on the streets toward the Hokage mansion, Rin couldn't restrain the question that had been itching to surface. Is there a problem with Hayashi? Naruto made a side glance to the curious girl and shook his head. It's complicated, Rinchen. We can talk about it later. The Kunoichi nodded, but her curiosity hadn't settled. At least, not until they finally stepped through the doorstep of Naruto's room. Experienced fingers brushed over the privacy seal Naruto had carved into the head of his bed, and with a flicker of his chakra, their conversation was secure from unauthorized ears. I made a promise to Hizashi's son during my first and last chunin exam. I promised Niji that if I became Hokage, I would change the Hyuga clan and erase the caged bird seal. When Niji died during the war, the Hyuga clan also united. But I don't want it to happen the same way. I want to fulfill my promise to Niji, but still have him live to see it. Nobody should have to die this time. You can't just erase a hundred-year-old tradition. I don't really understand everything that happened in your timeline, but I can still see that it was the result of a chain of events. You can't just waltz to Minato or to the compound and forbid them to use it anymore. It's not that easy. You have to change their mindset first. I know Hayashi. He trained me on Mount Mayaboku in Taijutsu when we were hiding from Madara and the Jubi. Maybe there is a way to speak sense into his strict head. Naruto furrowed his brows and chewed on his lower lip. Naruto. Rin shook her head slowly. What's going inside your thick skull? The boy flinched at his name, but in the next moment his muscles relaxed. I missed it, he murmured, a soft smile on his features. My name, I missed hearing it. Don't change the topic. What do you want to do? I don't know yet. Naruto shrugged and leaned back on his bed. He folded his arms behind his head and locked his gaze on the empty ceiling. But I'll find a way to keep my promise, Naruto stated with a new determination in his eyes. Naruto lazily occupied the long couch inside Minato's office. He rested his head on his folded arms while his feet hung freely over the armrest on the other side. He was on the verge of sleep again, but any time he almost drifted into his dreams, someone knocked on the door and a bunch of loud genin rushed inside the office. So he instead gave up on trying to get some rest and twisted his head in an awkward position to look at his father. When is Gadu's hearing? Two days from now. His main charge was treason, but several vendors appeared all over fire and wave and charged Gadu individually with blackmailing and exhortion. He will receive a long sentence in one of the prison cells of Kanoha's strict correctional facility. He won't be released until his hairs turned white. He deserves it. You really don't like him, do you? I've got my reasons, Naruto snorted and finally rose from his twisted position to sit properly on the couch. Another soft knock could be heard from the door, and this time Inoichi, stepped inside and strolled to the middle of the office after a bow to the Hokage and a playful salute to Naruto. Report, Minato stated casually. However, his curiously sparkling blue eyes gave a lie to his uncaring tone. The TNI department has registered 28 remaining root troops who didn't leave with Danzu. 
Most of them volunteered for our rehabilitation program, but the rest refused to cooperate. They're still loyal to Danzu, and they won't change their mind. The brainwash was too deep. What are the options for those who refused our help? Naruto perked up immediately, and the Yamanaka finally averted his gaze from his leader. We don't have too many for those who won't let go of their old life and Danzu. We either lock them in a cell or seal away their chakra and ability to hurt anyone. We could manipulate their memories, but that's merely a temporary solution. The human brain is tricky, with time, they would realize our intrusion in their minds. A deep frown appeared on Inoichi's features, and he turned back to Minato. I doubt any of them could ever be integrated into our troops. They'll never be able to have a normal life. They've known only this life form, and without a goal, without Danzu's guidance, they've lost the reason of being alive. I'm counting on several suicide attempts in their lines. What if we disband them? They'll eventually start to look for Danzu, and we'll know his hiding place, Naruto asked a little hesitantly, and he immediately glanced up to his father with his searching, cerulean pools. This could also be an option, Minato said hesitantly. His brows furrowed as he sank deep inside his thoughts. Inoichi. Tell this to Shikaku. We could weigh this option and find a way to track their movements. Maybe we can plant one of the Aburame's bugs to trail them. Report back when you have a complete and detailed plan. The blonde interrogator nodded and left the room after a short bow to the Hokage and a thumbs up to Naruto. With time, the two blondes returned to their previous occupation. Minato continued his silent battle with the bureaucracy while his brother continued to do nothing on the soft couch. Minato had finally lost his interest in winning the war with the big pile of documents, and he instead directed his eyes toward his relaxed relative. A cheeky and cunning smile spread across Minato's face. You and Rin have become very close lately. Naruto shot a suspicious glance at his father from the corner of his eyes. What's that supposed to mean? You know, when a boy and a beautiful girl meet a lot privately, it could start some gossip. Naruto shot up from his seat. His mouth was left open and his eyes were wide. I, we. No. Yes. She's nice and beautiful. But. I would never. Naruto vehemently tried to protest, no coherent sentence left his face. His cheeks were flaming with a crimson color. Minato's laughter filled the whole office, and Naruto folded his arms in front of his chest in a defensive manner once more with a familiar pout already in its place. Hey, it's not funny. I mean it. We're just friends. I would never think about her like that. I mean, she's nice and beautiful, but for one, she's too young for me, second, she likes Kakashi in third dash, the sentence suddenly stuck in his throat as he eyed the maniacally laughing Minato. An annoyed expression appeared on his face. Can we change the topic? Naruto muttered with an irritated expression and a massive blush on his face. My love life is private. Even if there was anyone, it wouldn't be Rin. She's not my type. Why not? Minato asked between two bouts of laughter while he desperately tried to wipe off his tears from his eyes. It's been already more than ten months since you arrived. You're a healthy boy, I'm pretty sure there's someone who's raised your interest. If Rin isn't your type, then who is? Naruto's annoyed expression gradually disappeared from his face, and his features became restrained. Minato's chuckle slowly died down as he eyed his suddenly silent relative for a long minute, watching as his cerulean eyes slowly drifted toward the windows to stare outside. They soon became distant and foggy as he was looking at something only he could see. Minato waited the situation, and this time, his voice wasn't mocking or teasing. It was soft as a parent's. Was Sakura your type? Naruto stiffened and didn't answer for long minutes. His gaze was still locked outside the office. The question was left hanging in the air between the two shinobi, and with each passing second, Minato regretted his asking more and more. 
But Naruto's face slowly softened, the edges of his lips turning upward into a small, kind smile. Sekiriken, was my teammate. Minato's surprised blue eyes flung wide open, and his muscles tensed. He didn't dare to move or even let out the breath he had sucked in in his surprise, afraid that his brother would stop. She was my first crush. She is. She was beautiful, and a really powerful kunoichi. She was like Kushina in a lot of ways, you know. Naruto's soft smile grew into a wide grin, but he still didn't meet Minato's gaze. She was short-tempered, and she could punch so hard. I once got a concussion during her rampage. Minato slowly let out the air he had been holding, his mouth moving into the kindest smile he could afford. He leaned onto his hands to get a comfortable position as he listened to his brother talk about his past for the very first time. And he didn't stop for a long time. He talked about his genin team, about the beautiful Sakura, about his other arrogant team member, about his perverted, lazy teacher. Minato didn't receive any important detail that could actually hint where he had came from, but the Hokage didn't care this time. He was glad for every single shard of his past. And Naruto continued. He told him tales about meaningless small events. But the weight of his burden on his shoulders lessened and lessened with each passing minute. And for the first time in endless months, he was at ease and peace. And he also had to admit, maybe Kurama had been right this whole time. Maybe he should just tell them everything. The next six weeks were truly the most peaceful period for Naruto ever since he had arrived there. He embraced the precious moments he could share with Rin, and finally, he had someone he could openly speak to about his problems. And Rin was a great audience. She always listened to him, helped him, supported him during the long nights they shared. They did nothing, just chatted, joked and teased each other and Naruto couldn't shake the feeling that Rin was doing this on a purpose, but he was still glad for those moments. Naruto was currently happily slurping his bowl of ramen, and when he finished, the empty dish joined the raising tower beside him. Kakashi sat next to him at the counter, his head lazily rested on his hand as he scrutinized his companion with a calculating gaze. Finally, the Jounin raised his head and turned toward the satisfied Namikaze. What's between you and Rin? An annoyed growl bubbled out from Naruto's lips. What's with everyone? A cheeky sparkle appeared in Naruto's eyes in an instant. Oh, you are jealous, Hataki? You don't have to be. We're only friends. It was Kakashi's turn to let out a snort. He didn't answer, but the nib of his ears turned a flaming crimson, and he showed his back to Naruto. It's okay then. Kakashi finally murmured, but it didn't go unnoticed for Naruto's sharp ears. His mouth perked up into a wide smile. Hey, do you want to spar? Kakashi finally turned, and after a half minute of hesitation, he nodded and was already on his feet. What are your clones doing? Rin glanced at the lonely bunshin in the corner of Naruto's room. It had been sitting there in a meditating pose ever since she arrived. Only the slow rise and fall of his chest indicated that it was breathing, which sounded quite strange since they were talking about a bunshin. The girl slowly walked closer to the motionless clone and raised her hand to poke it on the forehead between the orangish outline of its eyes. I wouldn't do that if I were you, the clone stated casually, not even giving a glance to the girl. Naruto let out a chuckle and went next to Rin. He is gathering Senjutsu Chakra. When I enter sage mode, I become a sensor. I can feel every living shinobi in fire country. Everyone? Rin raised a doubting eyebrow. Where's Kakashikan? Naruto glanced at the clone who was more than eager to prove the previous statement. At training field 7 since I entered sage mode. Where's Jiriyazama? At the bath. Researching. Rin took a moment to digest the information before asking, and where are Minato and Kushina? The clone's face suddenly reddened and his amber eyes snapped open, his face moving into the perfect mirror of shock. Even his ears flamed with a vicious scarlet. What? 
Naruto asked warily, but the blushing clone only shook his head vehemently. Trust me boss, you don't want to know. Naruto and the clone stared at each other with strange expressions while Rin looked on in confusion. I think I let you disperse yourself only during the night when I'll already be asleep. The clone eagerly nodded, and no other words was exchanged about what the clone had seen. Or more likely sensed. The trio settled down into a pleasant state of silence. Rin occupied herself with a thick medical scroll while Naruto was busy to outline a new type of seal. The girl glanced toward the motionless clone from time to time. In the end, she couldn't stand it anymore. Who are you looking for? Naruto didn't answer for a long minute, but Rin could feel that she tapped into something sensitive as the question hung above their heads like a guillotine's sharp blade. Just as she was about to give up the hope that she would actually receive an answer, Naruto's low tone stabbed the silence. I'm looking for Madara. I've still got time before he will manipulate Toby. A deep, confused frown crawled up Rin's face. Toby? The masked guy? Why do you want to save him? Because he was just a puppet, a tool in Madara's hands who danced as that bastard pulled the strings. I didn't think too much about him, but now that I've thought more and more about it, everything was too odd. Madara was an ancient leader who fell from grace faked his own death, came to despise what was once his clan. And yet he saved a boy from that same hated family out of sentiment. But that boy was something else. During the fight, he told us that he wanted to get out, to leave the cave, but they wouldn't let him. And suddenly he was allowed to the outside world only to witness his loved one's death. Naruto shook his head. Madara was old and weak, and he needed someone who would carry out his will. He had found Toby to influence and use as a mere tool, like a figure on the chessboard. He really loved her, didn't he? Naruto made a side glance and measured Rin up from head to toe. The blonde averted his cerulean pools once more to stare out of his window. Yeah. He really loved you. What? Rin's eyes widened and she swept her head toward the blonde. His gaze was still locked on something nobody else could see. He dived into his memories as they continued to flash in front of his eyes. Naruto's weak voice filled the small room. Toby unleashed the war and the jubi on the world to revive a person. The girl for whom war was unleashed was you, Noera Rin. You died on a mission in Kiri around this time. Kakashi had to. Naruto shook his head once more in an attempt to get rid of the disturbing memories. You. Died, and Abito couldn't endure it. He was the one under the mask. He survived the damage during your last mission, and Madara found him, healed him, manipulated him until he became a tool of a madman. But it won't happen this time. Kiri and Konoha are allies now. We can save Abito's sanity. His only answer was silence. Time froze while Rin's hand shakily clenched around the soft bedsheet under her knees. Naruto continued in the hopes that it might calm her down. I've been trying to find him ever since I regained my memories. As I said, with sage mode I can sense everybody, but until now, I couldn't even get a glimpse of him. He must be under some sort of seal, like the ones Orochimaru used in his lab's dash, Abito. Abito is alive? Naruto still didn't turn, but when he felt the bed shifting under him as Rin inched closer, he moved to face the shaking girl. Abito is alive? Rin repeated once again. Her voice was raspy and faltering by the sudden grip around her throat. Naruto watched the girl for an infinite, tense minute. Only Rin's unsteady breathing could be heard in the silent room. The blonde slowly nodded and in the next moment, Rin hurled into his arms. Tremoring hands clenched desperately onto his clothes, the sweet and salty tears of relief soaking his attire. Naruto slowly raised his hands to give a reassuring hug to the quietly shaking Rin. She wasn't hysterical, only silently crying with one or two muffled sobs. I knew it, Rin whimpered into the soft fabric of his soaked and crumpled shirt. I've always known it. 
Na, Naruto, Rin exhaled softly into the empty training ground. Her back was resting against one of the three thick training poles, and the named blonde leisurely laid on the soft grass with his folded arms below his head. His azure eyes were locked on the same toned sky and the soundlessly floating, puffy white clouds. Don't call me that outside. Someone might hear. You said no one's even good enough to sneak up on you besides Kakashikan. In my timeline. But here and now, it's happened way too much for my liking, Naruto muttered, his eyes still locked on the blue sky. He suddenly raised one of his arms to point toward an unassuming puff of white. Hey! That one looks almost like Kakashi. That's his crazy hair and it got only one eye, see? Rin traced back his pointing finger and grimaced. Your imagination's wild. That one looks like a horse, not poor Kakashikan. Naruto tilted before twisting his head to the side with a concentrating frown on his face. It still looks like Kakashi to me. Can I ask you something? Naruto nodded, and Rin immediately utilized the permission. What happened to Abito? I mean, you told me a lot of things already, but I still don't understand. He was so much like you. He was always cheerful and clumsy, and he always stated that he wanted to become Hokage and I, I just can't understand how he could have changed so much. Naruto slowly raised himself and inched closer to the pole to mimic Rin's posture. I don't know exactly what he went through, but I think I can understand him more than anyone. Being lonely is hellish. But still. That idiot. I'm angry, you know. Even if I would have died, would never approve something like that. I'm ashamed of his actions. How did he think that killing so many people only for my sake would give him any happiness? If he would have really loved me that much, I would have been more than happy to see him become Hokage and live a happy life. He hasn't done anything yet, Naruto reminded her in a hushed tone. But it's already inside him. And it hurts. I feel betrayed because with that dream word he would have forgotten me, it's like he wants to create some. Copy rather than treasure the time we'd spent with each other. Two don't want to be forgotten, Rin pressed, but her gaze suddenly became distant and her features softened. I always believed in him, that he would have been a great Hokage. I was sure he would make it if he was dedicated enough. But now, I'm doubting it. I'm doubting him. It won't happen this time, Rinchen, Naruto murmured softly. His gaze traveled up once more to the sky to spot a lonely eagle as it slowly circled above them. I think Minato wants something. Rin traced back his gaze and nodded, slowly straightening from her seat. The majestic bird's continuous circles were getting smaller and smaller as it slowly floated closer to them until it soundlessly landed atop of Rin's pole. The girl raised an eyebrow and glanced toward the blonde, but the graceful predator didn't avert its gaze from the kunoichi. I think the one Minato wants to see this time is you, Rinchen. The girl nodded once more, and with a flicker of her chakra, she was gone. She's a nice girl, isn't she? No kidding a war was unleashed for her. Naruto turned toward the eagle with a wide smile on his face. It didn't answer, only tilted his head to the side as it eyed the still smiling blonde with its sharp, amber eyes. A faint knock interrupted Naruto's nap. He slowly rose from his bed to look out of the window, and the remains of his previous dream were instantly gone. His brow shot upward as he spotted the crouching ANBU on his ledge and hurriedly moved toward and opened the window. Hokajesima summons you. He's waiting in the office. Naruto nodded and the messenger retreated back into the long shadows. Nothing even hinted at his existence once he was gone. Naruto glanced toward the slowly setting sun, and a deep, troubled frown crawled up on his face. The last beams of the dying orb covered everything with an ominous crimson shade. The Hokage monument in the distance seemed to burn in the fire of the vicious light. With one troubled glance at the reddish glowing Hokage monument, Naruto jumped out from his window to rush toward his destination. Naruto ran his azure pools along the people in the office, 
and he couldn't shake off the nudging feeling from the back of his mind that something was very wrong. Everyone was tense beyond words, all attendants waiting for Minato to finally speak. Kakashi was leaning against the hard wall in the back of the office, his hands casually buried in his pockets, but Naruto could still see the strain in his back despite his lazy composure. Kushina was also there, silently standing next to Kakashi while Jiraiya soundlessly sat on the couch Naruto used for napping during the past, pleasant weeks. Shikaku stood next to his leader as a silent support, his eyes closed shut and his arms folded in front of his chest. Only Rin was missing. An ominous feeling viciously crawled up on his spine from inch to inch, until it settled around his throat to squeeze it. His mouth suddenly became dry, and the hair on the back of his neck rose. What happened, Minato? Naruto asked in a cautious, low tone. But his father didn't look up to meet with his demanding gaze nor did he blink for long time. His eyes were carefully glued on his empty desk like a statue's. Only his telling wince indicated that he had actually heard the question. Minato finally opened his mouth, but no words came out at first. Nor for his second try. He could whisper out his words with a shaky voice only at his third attempt. Noera Rin was killed in action. The world slipped out from under Naruto's feet, and his senses dulled. Minato continued to talk, but Naruto couldn't comprehend any further word of it. He heard nothing. He felt nothing. His father was still talking, but Naruto shakily turned and swayed out from the office without a word. Nobody tried to stop him. His eyes were stinging, his mouth was dry, and an invisible force painfully clenched his throat and his chest, but no tears came this time to give him any respite from his sorrow. Naruto silently walked through the village, letting his feet take the lead. He finally reached the familiar training ground where he had first became a ninja. When later he tried to remember how he reached his destination, he couldn't. It was too painful to be aware. The birds happily sang their mockingly cheerful song, not caring about Naruto or his misery. Crickets and cicadas joined into the joyful sonata and the soft wind used the tender grass and the leaves as her harp. Mother Nature didn't care about his feelings. She smugly rubbed her ignorance into his face. His fist clenched into fist and his nails dug painfully into his palms in a sudden rush of anger, burning his insides like hot acid. Rage was growling inside his core, filling his mind with its dense red fog. Blood gathered in his palms and traveled down from his hands as his nails finally teared into his flesh, only to land on the hard ground which gluttonously drank up every droplet of the crimson essence. His eyes still stung from the unleashed tears, his throat was closed by the lump, but no tears came out from his pools. A small blue bird hopped on a tree branch next to Naruto and joined nature's happy symphony with its own derisive aria. At that very moment, something snapped inside him. It could have been his heart or his sanity. He wasn't quite sure himself when he later thought about the until now growing fury over flooded his dam in an instant, and devastating anger washed over his form. With a quick motion, he punched the ground in front of him in an attempt to dismiss his anger. The soil shattered, tussocks flying into the air to land far away from him. But nothing changed. Naruto punched once more, this time with more force. But it didn't give him any redemption. So he didn't stop. He kicked, screamed, and punched everything around him until his limbs and throat became sore and the knuckles of his hands raw and bloody. Powerful jutsu struck, and chakra whirled around him viciously during his rampage. He left nothing untouched. The edge of the thick woods were charred, the ground shattered, and the three thick poles lay on several faraway parts of the destroyed training field. He suddenly stopped as all power disappeared from his sore and strained limbs. Only his harsh raspy breathing and his pounding heart echoed around him. But it didn't help him at all. His anger vanished and devastating emptiness took its place. Thankfully though, the birds stopped singing their mockingly cheerful melody. 
Naruto's eyes traveled toward the far end of the training field where the memorial stone stood out from the destroyed landscape. He gradually turned and dragged himself until he finally reached the monument. Uzumaki Naruto silently stood in front of an obsidian stone. His sight was locked on the smooth surface. The sun playfully bounced on its shiny surface in the same insulting, happy way as the birds had sung previously. His blue orbs ran through the names already carved into the stone, then moved to the first empty part of the memorial that he knew would filled with Rin's name. Naruto slowly sunk onto the hard soil. His teeth painfully clenched together while sorrow overwhelmed his mind. Kurama silently withdrew into the deepest part of his mind, his crimson orbs focused on something else on a familiar entity that leisurely rested his back against a dead osier tree once again and cheerfully hummed a rhythm. The once green grass around him was withered and black. He did nothing, just sat there with a smug smile on his face as he hummed. A low growl echoed inside Naruto's mindscape as it bubbled out from Kurama's twisted lips in a vicious way. Two hours later, when Kakashi got the courage to look for the blonde, he found Naruto on the same spot he had sank. His eyes were locked on the memorial, hazed but not from the tears. They looked somewhere else. Somewhere far away. And Kakashi didn't disturb him. He instead sat down next to the blonde to lock his own teary eye on the memorial. His high tie was soaked by his hidden tears, but the wet spot was evident on the soft fabric. They stayed like that for a long time, none of them daring to disturb the other's silent mourning. It could have been minutes but it felt like never-ending hours for Naruto. And it had actually been hours since the sky was already ink black and only the star's faint glow gave any light to their silent form. Finally, Kakashi let out a choked sound, and it pushed Naruto out from his own small world. The Jinchuriki slowly raised his arm and locked it around the trembling boy who was no older than fourteen. Eventually, Kakashi calmed down. Naruto slowly rose from his seat and raised his hand to his teammate. Kakashi watched the offered hand for a hesitant moment before he gradually accepted it and stood from his hunched seat. They walked side by side toward the Hokage mansion on the empty streets of the sleeping village. Kakashi. What happened to Rin? The boy didn't answer for a while, the question left hanging above their heads in a threatening way. Finally, Kakashi let out a soft exhale. We still don't know the details. She left for a cranked mission to Kusa to support a Chunin team as a medic on an escort mission. She snuck away from her camp during the night, and the team searched through the whole area for her at the morning. Kakashi didn't continue for a hesitant second then finally braced himself. They found her body near the place where Abito had died. Naruto immediately froze in motion. How did she die? Naruto asked ruthlessly, his voice didn't falter this time it was a demanding order. Kakashi also stopped. However, he didn't look up from the dirt road as he answered. His body was collected, but his voice uncontrollably trembled. She was stabbed by a missing Nin. He confused her for someone else in Inazuka. He wanted vengeance on the clan for his dead wife. She had to die because an idiot thought she was someone else. She shouldn't have had to die this way. It was meaningless. Kakashi started to tremble once again. I should have been there. I promised to Abito that I was going to protect her. You understand. His last wish for me was to protect her. He left her to me. And I failed. I failed once again. I couldn't save Abito, and I couldn't save Rin. You will also die. Sensei will also die. Everyone is going to keep dying around me. I failed, and I will fail again. Kakashi shoved Naruto to the side and sprinted away from the blonde to disappear into the chilly night. Naruto emotionlessly stared at the point between two houses where he last saw Kakashi. No, he said with a hollow voice. The one who failed everybody was me. Naruto. A vicious growl bubbled out from Naruto's sore throat as the only answer. 
Naruto, listen. Shut up, he spat into his empty room. He had finally retreated after Kakashi's outburst on the street, but he couldn't get rid of the booming voice inside his mind as Kurama continued to call for him. Eventually, he gave up, and when he next opened his azure pools, he was face to face with the beast itself. His crimson eyes warily observed the tensed boy in front of him who refused to meet with his gaze. Naruto, listen to me. An odd sound rushed out from Naruto's throat in response. It was something between a snort, a pained sob and a sarcastic laugh. He still locked his gaze on the soft grass in front of him, but soon, he slowly raised his head, and the ancient old bijou couldn't restrain a flinch. His jailer's every emotion was unmercifully shoved at him at once when their piercing pools met. They were there, bare and naked. The sorrow. The disappointment. The betrayal. And finally, the doubt and distrust. The last time I listened to you, an innocent girl died because of my decision. Naruto spat out the words like they were the acid that had been burning his throat until then. What? Kurama's eyes suddenly widened as he comprehended Naruto's words. You think Rin died because of you? No. Naruto's expression suddenly hardened to ice-cold steel. His disdainful and accusing glare pierced through the fox's heart but he didn't raise his voice. But it would have been better if Naruto started shouting because his cold tone sent a shiver down Kurama's spine. I think Rin died because of you. You were the one who told me to confess. She went to that place because I told her that Abito was still alive. She wouldn't even be there if you hadn't forced me to tell her everything. She died because of you. This is nonsense. Kurama raised his head as he boomed, his voice viciously echoing in the slowly darkening mindscape. You really want to blame someone? Blame Uchiha Madara. It was he who ignited the flames of war, he who made the great shinobi villages dance to his tune. Blaming you or Madara. It doesn't matter. Can't you see that everything is happening again? Kakashi was right. Everybody keeps on dying around me. First Rin, the next will be my parents, then Gigi, Niji, B, Sunadabakan, Gara, and everyone else. I let my guard down, and look what happened. You can't save everybody. I have to. I promised that I'd break the circle of hatred. Look what it's done to Rin. She died because of some pointless vengeance. I have to do something to end this madness. They believed in me. All of them. Jiraiya, my father, and Nagato. They entrusted it to me Dash, you're not a god. You can't shoulder everything on your own. I couldn't save Rin. All of this was for nothing. Abito will turn into Toby. How could I prevent all those things if I wasn't even able to save Rin? I've failed. Naruto's voice suddenly became weak, and his anger was gone in a heartbeat. Look at what you've already achieved. You saved Gara's mother and his sanity. You helped to integrate the Uchiha. You got rid of Orochimaru, saved Tenzo, and Danzu is out of town. The fates of the five great nations are now intertwined. The bond is thin and fragile, but it's still there. You still think we've done nothing? That's bullshit. No answer came from Naruto, his eyes fixed on the green grass at Kurama's paws. A chuckle. Echoed in the silence, and the demon fox immediately tensed his muscles as a new presence stepped into the light. An identical blonde teen leisurely walked closer and closer to his counterpart, his hands casually clasped behind his back. His silhouette was sharp, and his until now foggy picture looked as solid as Naruto's. Only his black scara and red irises indicated that this being wasn't a simple clone. The newcomer slowly hovered around the blonde until it finally settled down next to Naruto and leaned onto his shoulder with his elbow. His face came closer until it could directly whisper into Naruto's ears. Yes. You failed them. You made Rin march to her own death. You failed Jiraiya. 
You failed your father and Nagato. Look what you have done. Nothing. Nothing has changed. Naruto flinched, and his face turned into a pained grimace. You haven't failed them, Naruto. Kurama pushed. Look at the fox, he purred into Naruto's ears once again, and the blonde obediently looked up to Kurama. You listened to his advice, and what happened? She died. You don't need him. We don't need him. We can solve this alone. Kurama dangerously narrowed his eyes. However, they weren't locked on his blonde jailer but on the dark aura next to him. It's not true. We can make it through without him. Until now, he has played with your head, with your emotions. He was the one who was pulling the strings in the background. Hasn't he been manipulating you for the past few months? He stole your memories and your opportunity to tell your parents who you really are. Do you still think that after all those lies they will trust you? He ruined everything. Naruto's eyes narrowed, and they sparked with a strange glint as they looked over his friend. Kurama's voice was suddenly shaky and desperate as he hurriedly blurted out, Do you remember what happened at the Waterfall of Truth? He is here again, manipulating you and Dash, shut up. Just shut up and leave me alone. I don't want to hear any more. I need time to think and, a faint knock interrupted Naruto's line of thoughts as it echoed inside his mindscape. The blonde shot one more accusing glare at the bijou before his form slowly faded away. Kurama's gaze was frozen on the place the blonde had previously stood until the dark projection let out a vicious chuckle. The first steps have already been made. You bastard. I won't let you influence him. And how are you planning to stop me? he asked with a mocking smirk on his face. I'll find a way to stop you. You can count on it. Kurama sent a determined glare toward the entity, one that even Naruto would acknowledge, but it only smugly smiled back. It was challenging, and Kurama was more than eager to pick up the gloves for Naruto's sake. Kushina gradually peeked through the vibrant orange door as soon she heard the blonde's muffled permission to enter. Her eyes danced across Naruto's slumped form and finally landed on the dark shadows under his always. Archly pools. The dark contour only enhanced his stabbing electric blue eyes and the sadness inside them. An invisible power squeezed her chest one last time before she stepped inside to slowly sit down next to Naruto. The blonde gradually leaned against her side, seeking comfort or some soothing warmth in the unusually cold night. She silently supported the time traveler for what felt like an eternity, not wanting to disturb him. Her hand traveled up on his spine gently to wrap it over his slumped shoulder, and Naruto bedded himself in the offered comfort almost immediately. It hurts, Naruto whispered. She gently removed the blonde's high tiet, letting his golden locks shroud his tightly shut eyes and shadow his misery. It was useless anyway. Her fingers tenderly brushed and stroked his hair away from his sight and placed a soft kiss on the blonde's forehead. I know, Kushina murmured. The small, warm contact burned Naruto's cold skin, but he didn't move. Kushina's gentle hands felt too good for his exhausted and troubled soul. It gave him the small relief he craved for. Naruto's body equilibrated on the thin verge of reality and redeeming sleep as his troubled mind finally settled down. In a minute, he passed the delicate line to sink into a dreamless slumber, an escape from his haunting demons. Warm arms wrapped around Minato from behind, and he immediately sank into the sweet and soft embrace. He didn't open his eyes to peer over his shoulder, Kushina's sweet, vanilla scent was unmistakable. A crimson tuft fell onto his shoulder, tickling his naked skin as it slipped down slowly on his bare arm, drawing goosebumps on its way. But strangely, it still felt pleasant. Minato welcomed this mirthful sensation in the dark and cold night. It was the middle of August. The night was everything but chilly after the daytime's heatwave. Even so, the blonde had still been freezing under the bedsheet. It came from his inside and Kushina's presence finally offered him the warmth he yearned for so much. How is Toraku? he whispered softly. 
asleep. She placed a soft kiss on the back of his neck and edged as close to him as close she could from her round tummy. But this was only because of his rampage at the training ground. I think some Genin teams will curse his mother's name. It will take ages and a lot of drank missions to shake it back to its previous form, Kushina tried to joke, but Minato's lips formed only a mocking shadow of a real smile. It was so forced that the redhead could feel it, even if she wasn't able to actually see it. I had to put Kakashi under a genjutsu to finally calm him down, Minato muttered into his pillow, and Kushina's gentle arms squeezed him reassuringly. I'm so sorry, Minato. Kushina exhaled softly and edged even closer to her husband. But she received no answer. Her brows furrowed when Minato's muscles tensed in his back against her chest. Look at me, Minato, she asked softly. The Hokage defiantly shook his head, not caring about the nudging feeling at the back of his head where Kushina's eyes were locked on his golden crown, he stubbornly refused to face his wife. But with time, his stubbornness broke. He needed her. The fearless Hokage gradually shifted in the soft bed to face with her, revealing his silent tears as they were traveling down on his cheeks. The wet lines vividly glittered in the faint light. I'm sorry, Minato, Kushina murmured, and her arms immediately wrapped around him, and Kanoha's yellow flash snuggled inside the offered embrace like a child seeking comfort from his mother. Kushina gently stroked his shaking back, desperately trying to give some redemption to her husband. After a while, Minato finally gathered himself. He couldn't stand the silence anymore. He opened his mouth, his voice cracking as his throat was still sore and dry. The missing Nin wasn't alone. The team found his partner. We know what happened only because of him. They both went after Rin, but that guy fell into a leftover trap from the war. The other left him there to die alone. Minato's brow furrowed. The other, who had killed Rin. He was butchered. Someone or something had torn him into shreds. Kushina let out a shaky breath. He deserved it. An oppressive silence loomed for a moment before Minato shifted in her embrace. I'm leaving after the funeral. The team reported something strange, and I want to see it with my own eyes. I won't be back for a week. I have to know what happened there. A deep frown appeared on Kushina's fine features. But she didn't make any comment, nor question her husband. If she had the right to know, he would tell her with time. So she inched closer to her man and wrapped her body around Minato to offer him as much comfort as she could. And also to receive her own from her loved one as this time, it was Kushina's turn to finally mourn for her lost friend. It was a better day for a wedding than a funeral. The summer's hot wave was unmerciful and ignorant about the sad event. The hot beams happily danced on the people's black dress who gathered to say their final farewell. The ceremony was short and moderate like every shinobi's. There was no need for a big ado. Her picture gently smiled from the black frame at the people who came to remember her. There were no big piles of flowers, nor fancy bouquets. The people were silent as they paid their tribute to their fallen comrade. When the ceremony finally ended, the rest of the closest friends gathered inside the Hokage mansion. Soon, they also dropped out. Only Kushina, Minato, and the remaining members of her previous team were left behind. They silently sipped their drinks around the dining table, occasionally one of them disturbing the stillness with one or two stories about the girl whose name was Rin Noera. The promising medic, the reliable teammate, the talented Kunoichi and the kind person she was. Jiraiya was the first to leave the small group, and gradually, both Minato and Kushina retreated to clean up the remains of the burial feast. Naruto had been clinging to the same cup of lukewarm sake the toad sage had shoved into his hands during the first toast. Two exhausted eyes drifted toward his withdrawn future sensei. Kakashi hadn't said a single word since his outburst. From what he had heard from Minato, Kushina dragged him from his apartment and shoved him into one of the guest rooms. No one should have been alone in a time like this. 
Never. The young teen, no older than fourteen, looked at least a decade older to Naruto. And he seemed definitely broken. Dark rings settled below his only visible eye, and his gaze was foggy as it emotionlessly stared at his own cup of tea that he had been holding since Naruto got his cup of sake. Before Naruto could dive further into his mind, Kakashi's raspy and shaky voice interrupted his line of thought. I'm going to join ANBU. Naruto didn't reply. He didn't know what he could say to the broken boy. But Kakashi, thankfully, didn't want any answer from him. He just wanted to tell it to someone and get rid of the small burden. Naruto already knew this would happen. Kakashi. No, his Kakashi had told him that he was in ANBU for years. It was his desperate escape from reality after Rin's death. He buried his emotions and his thoughts under those years in ANBU. Kakashi interrupted Naruto's thoughts once again. You're the first one I've told. The commander approached me after Abito's death, but I had declined it back then. I had to protect Rin. An ironic, empty chuckle bubbled out under Kakashi's mask. It was so hollow that Naruto almost flinched when it echoed back once. But I guess you nor Minato nor Jiraiya are indigent for my protection. You're way above my league. The silver-haired boy seized the blonde for a long second. His emotions suddenly overran his ink-black orbs. You are way stronger than me. I am not able to protect Minato or Kushina, but you are. Naruto locked his gaze with his future sensei. The inky eyes desperately pleaded to him, and he was more than eager to remove some of the weight from Kakashi's shoulders. He could bear it. He could endure this for his sake. The blonde made a determined nod. I won't let my friends die. I promise. And I don't go back on my word. Kakashi observed the teen for a moment before he nodded and let out a relieved sigh, averting his gaze to stare out the window. The tension in his muscles visibly lessened, and they stayed in silence for long minutes. Kushina's faint voice slipped into the room as she chatted with Minato. The soft tinkling of the cutlery and the running water dimly reached Naruto's sensitive ears. The night Rin had died. Kakashi softly murmured. I saw something when I was asleep. I first thought it was a dream, but it felt so real. The pain dash, Kakashi's hands clenched onto his black shirt above his heart, his voice faltering, and his eye was shining with the first wave of fresh tears. Naruto's muscles tensed as Kakashi's hands released his clothes to travel toward his forehead protector to rub the cold surface of the silver insignia. Did something happen to your Sharingan? Naruto asked in a hushed tone, and Kakashi immediately stiffened. The Hataki slowly turned toward the blonde and shot him a suspicious, demanding gaze. However, Naruto didn't care about the teen's demanding eyes, slowly raising his right hand toward Kakashi's face. The teen's muscles tensed until the breaking point as the fingers inched closer and closer to him while the blonde's expression stayed strangely hollow. Kakashi's eye widened and the blonde slipped a cold finger under the soft fabric of his Hitai 8. He immediately grabbed the arm to restrain him from any further movement. An ink black, wide and confused eye stared into emotionless, cerulean blue ones. They held their gaze for unending seconds, maybe minutes. But it could have been easily more as the time seemed to pause around them. Goosebumps rose under Kakashi's attire as his always covered eye suddenly connected with the fresh air that slipped under the fabric through the tiny gap made by Naruto's finger. Let me take a look, Naruto exhaled in a dull, but still demanding tone. Kakashi eyed the boy in front of him suspiciously, but his grip loosened on his wrist with time until he finally released it and let his arms drop into his lap. The blonde paused for a second like he wasn't really sure himself if he wanted to see what was under it. But his gaze hardened, and he gradually pushed the forehead protector up to reveal a closed eye. The scar was still pink despite the medical treatment and the long time it had to heal. It would still take months until the scar would whiten and years more for it to not stand out viciously from his skin. But it would never fade perfectly. 
Kakashi had to face with the ever-present reminder of Abito's death every time he looked into a mirror without his forehead protector. A cold shiver crawled up on Kakashi's spine as the summer's hot air suddenly felt chilly against his exposed skin. Open it, Naruto said with a low, commanding voice. This time, Kakashi obeyed without hesitation. His eyelids slowly parted, revealing an all-too-familiar pattern. A lonely tear ran down from Kakashi's revealed eye. Maybe it was because of his previous thoughts, or maybe it was only because the air irritated it. A vicious crimson iris greeted Naruto as he traced back the thin, wet line on Kakashi's face. Three stretched, ink-black triangles stood out from the ruby background, and Naruto couldn't shake off the feeling that, despite the fact that they were motionless, his eyes slowly whirled like a pinwheel in a child's innocent hands. A memory flashed inside his mind, that last stabbing glare Abito had given him before he died. That look had haunted him for months. It was filled with hatred, but deep down, it was also desperate. The black-haired man had realized something important in the last moment. It was regret. It started, Naruto muttered with a dark and hollow voice. It was so emotionless and unusual from the blonde that Kakashi couldn't ignore the sudden need to have some space between him and the blonde. He inched backward, immediately covering his eye. What started? Kakashi asked with a demanding voice. However, Naruto either didn't hear him or didn't care about his question. The blonde rose from his seat and turned to leave the room, but he stopped at the opened window. You should deactivate it. It constantly drains your chakra that way. Go to Fugaku and ask for his advice. He will help. What started? Kakashi stubbornly repeated his question, but Naruto just gave him one empty look over his shoulder before he jumped out of the window to disappear in the long shadows. Yes. It started, purred an identical voice to Naruto's in his mindscape. However, instead of the blonde sunny voice, it was dark. A copy of the blonde emerged from the tree lean to lean against a hollow osier tree. His footsteps creaked on the withered grass and the dead leaves that had fallen from the once sound and majestic plant. It still struggled for its life, but it was on the verge of dying. A threatening snarl stabbed through the flora where Karama paced up and down like a real fox would do behind the bars of a cage. But it didn't concern Naruto's dark copy. He flung his head backward and let out a booming laugh. Jiraiya peered into Minato's narrowed blue eyes. His gaze was glued on the blonde's troubled expression who slowly parted his mouth to lick his suddenly dry lips before he talked. Repeat it once more. If Jiraiya wasn't equally troubled, he would feel annoyed. But he was also just as confused as his student. I planted a spy in rain just as you wished. It was hard for her to sneak inside, and it took her a damn lot of time to infiltrate the village and blend into the community. She ran a small hotel in the capital. Jiraiya shut his mouth, and the muscles in his jaw tightened before he continued. She reported that Danzu has fled to aim, and the people whisper that he is negotiating with Hanzo. Jiraiya closed his eyes and let out a breath to calm himself down, his expression slowly relaxing as the gathered pressure lessened inside his coils. I had also received a message through her from Uchiha Shursue. That boy is very smart for a midget. Danzu and the group slept there a week ago, and that ANBU somehow recognized her. He slipped this message into her pouch. The toad sage raised his hand, a small scroll trapped inside. With the anticipation of your consent, I decoded it myself. Danzu has sided with Hanzo the Salamander, and they will meet with a slowly growing organization next Friday at 11 near Amigakure no Sato. Shursue didn't know the exact location, only the time. He will send us further information after the meeting is done. A bunch of kids have stood up against Hanzo, but they're slowly becoming a pain for the Salamander, so he decided to get rid of them. They call themselves Akatsuki. And Danzu seems to think he will gain an ally for his plans. He's planning to come back to Kanoha and get your seat by force with a coup. 
a shadow twitched under Minato's window, carefully hidden from the unwanted eyes. A deep frown was plastered on its features as the being concentrated on the discussion above with every nerve. When Jiraiya started to talk about another matter, the shadow flickered a finger on a seal carved under one of the tower's uncountable tiles. In the next moment, their conversation muffled as the small opening on the privacy seal closed. With a blur of his golden hair, Uzumaki Naruto raced toward his room to grab his backpack and head toward the village hidden in the rain. However, it was a very bad choice, since Jiraiya wasn't finished. He just paused, letting his eyes observe his student a little more before he braced himself and cleared his throat. There's something more. My spy in Kusa spotted an Uchiha. Minato stiffened, and his eyes narrowed instantly. There shouldn't be anyone there from the clan. Yeah, I know, Jiraiya whispered into the room. I have to leave the village for a few weeks to contact my people. We need more information. The Hokage slowly nodded, and the white-haired man disappeared from the office after one last glance at the motionless leader. Minato locked his gaze on the horizon, his azure eyes glued on the people of Kanoha. Minato inched closer to the edge and leaned his forehead on the window, resting it on the cold surface in the hope that it would calm his burning thoughts. No one heard his whisper as it left a thin sheet of fog on the window. Toraku's Uchiha wasn't Orochimaru. Dozens of shinobi stood in a straight line at the top of a long cliff, peering down at two desperate men. A small group was dressed in Kanoha's ANBU gear while the rest were wearing the attire of a different village. A high tiet shined in the dim cloud light with four engraved lines, the stylized symbol of the never-ending rain of the area. An eternally cold rain poured on their already soaked clothes, flowing between the layers until it finally reached their bones. Each of them tensed their muscles, ready to attack while the rain flowed immortally from the thick, gray clouds which shrouded the azure blue sky. Nothing could be heard in the landscape, only the dripping rain, the accelerating heartbeats and the raspy breathing from the bottom of the canyon. A blue-haired woman sucked in a breath as a man violently tossed her, and a kunai closed the distance between him and her neck. It threateningly drew a thin red line as it nicked her soft skin. A deep voice boomed into the silence, and it clearly echoed inside the canyon, not muffled by the thing he wore, his lower face was mostly obscured by a helmet-like respirator. Yahiko, as the leader of this gang, you will die here. Today. If you don't, this girl will get it. With a quick nod, a kunai flew toward the two men inside the canyon to pierce the soft mud in front of a thin man. You with the red hair. Use this to kill him. If you do, I'll let this girl free. Hanzo shook Conan once more to give weight to his previous words, not caring that the kunai was still close to the girl's throat. Don't, Nagato. Don't worry about me. You two get out of here. The kunoichi desperately shot out from the iron grip. Her eyes pleaded to every kami on and above earth in the hope that he would obey. But deep down, she had already knew that no such help would come to her. Muscles tensed until the breaking point in the shadows of a cliff. With will above a normal human, Uzumaki Naruto forced himself to wait until he could strike and flee without using anything that would reveal his real identity. If he was forced to use any of his special moves, he would be doomed. Danzu and the others would recognize the source, and that would be troublesome. A small smile appeared on his face, and he glanced back to his motionless clone who had been meditating and gathering as much energy from nature as he could manage during their minimal time. He traveled for a week with insane speed with minimal rest, but he still arrived late. He was supposed to prevent the whole meeting and not let himself to be seen by Danzu or Hanzo nor by their troops. His brows furrowed as he spied the one-eyed leader of Root. When Nagato had told him this story, the Warhawk hadn't been present. But it seemed that Danzu was desperate enough to personally attend. His azure eyes drifted to the aging man's right where a short boy with a crow mask warily observed the blue-haired girl. Naruto's teeth squeezed together when Nagato hesitantly leaned for the kunai to shakily grab the soaked barrel. 
Nagato couldn't see anything, couldn't hear anything. His senses dulled, the noise of his own raspy breathing not reaching his brain, uncannily similar to the oddly loud sound of his drumming heart not reaching his ears. The only thing he could feel was the ice-cold surface of the kanai in his hand. His purple eyes just stared into the nothingness for a long second, but they immediately flung toward the side when he saw an orange blur at the edge of his vision. A soft, warm and familiar hand grabbed his own wrist, forcing it to move to a direction he didn't want it to. Time suddenly stopped as the ice-cold blade met with its target, and the kunai moved further and further into the flesh. The blade suddenly became warmer, and in the farthest part of his weary brain, Nagato could feel as hot liquid flowed onto his own shaking hands, soaking and warming up his fingers around the barrel of the weapon. The echo of a painful hiss could be heard inside the canyon, but it was almost immediately replaced with irritated swearing, kicking Nagato out from his temporary stasis. He slowly turned his head and desperately tried to focus his eyes to meet with the wide and surprised blue eyes of Yahiko, staring at the other side of him. The red-haired man slowly turned his head to the side, tracing his friend's sight where a grimacing brown-haired boy stood. Could you release the kunai? It hurts like hell, he muttered with an annoyed tone. Nagato blinked in his surprise and gradually glanced down at his own hands where a second ago, he would have sworn it tore into Yahiko's flesh. Instead of finding a bloody stomach, the stranger's scarlet-stained hand gripped the blade of the kunai, restraining it while his other hand was holding Yahiko farther from the knife. The redhead flinched a step backward and immediately released the weapon. It reached the soaked surface of the ground with a loud splash, the remains of the crimson liquid already coloring a small puddle reddish under their feet where it dripped. Yahiko and Nagato stared at the stranger with wide eyes and disbelief written all over their faces while the young man in front of them only shook his bloody hand, continuously mumbling something incoherent. He seemingly wasn't in pain despite the weapon having cut his palm wide open. He looked just annoyed and irritated. The redhead narrowed his eyes on the chocolate brown, they were fixed on the strangely shaped pupils. They were horizontal like amphibians. He could feel a thin layer of warm chakra all over the face of the stranger, the obvious trace of a henge. A distant and painful moan shook them out from their small word, and the three men immediately flung their heads toward the source. Hanzo was obviously angry as well as the one-eyed warhawk. You ruined my plans, stranger. You made a big mistake. I don't like when someone encroaches into my game. The named stranger only folded his arms in front of his chest, painting his clothes crimson where his hands connected with the fabric. His eyes traveled along the long line of shinobi standing above them, pausing for a second on the smallest one with the crow mask next to Danzu. They were ready to attack at the smallest sign. The stranger then just shrugged in the end before, faster than anyone could see, slamming his hands onto the ground. Almost immediately, an electrical sparkle could be heard all over the field, and dozens of elite fighters struggled under the lightning chakra coming out from the wet ground on both sides of the two leaders. However, to one shinobi's surprise, behind Danzu, the jutsu carefully avoided him. The attack didn't last long, only for a brief second but it was enough to knock out most of the shinobi while the others obviously struggled to stay conscious or on their feet. The stranger straightened himself, carefully observing the remaining opponents for a long, tense second. Hanzo harshened his grip on the stunned Kunoichi in his arms and readied his muscles to slice her throat open with the kunai still in his hands if the boy even twitched. Nagato immediately stiffened. Together with Yahiko, but the stranger did nothing. The boy tilted his head to the side and observed the scene silently for another long second until a wide and satisfied grin spread across his face. Then, the ground simply exploded under Hanzo's feet when a copy of the stranger jumped out from the soft soil and grabbed the kunoichi out from his hands. They gracefully landed beside the two comrades, Yahiko immediately taking care of the kunoichi and sending a thankful glance toward the stranger. A harsh voice echoed around the small team as Shimura Danzu spoke for the first time after he surveyed his remaining troops. Who are you? 
The stranger tilted his head to the side again, eyeing the man for a never-ending moment before a large grin appeared on his face, his golden eyes sparkling with a cheeky glow. The hero. Who else? Danzo took a step forward, hostility practically seeping through his skin. You are a powerful shinobi. We can be useful to each other. A strange noise left the stranger's lips, close to a chuckle as if Danzu had just made a joke. I don't think we would get along, jerk. Danzu dangerously narrowed his eyes, observing every movement on the stranger's face, every twitch of his muscles. The way he carried himself, the way he stayed stoic even in this desperate situation in front of them. The confidence and power he was radiating. The two leaders made a quick glance at each other, and a silent unity formed in that mere second. Most of their troops were down, and that man over there was too powerful. We're leaving, Danzu stated with an emotionless voice. However, if looks could kill, the boy would have been dead by then. I'll be watching you, the boy warned them and narrowed his eyes. His pools drifted toward Shursway for a second and slowly lowered his head. A small nod. A simple movement, what everyone else would just toss to the side. But for the kid, it told everything that he needed. An ally from Kanoha. With this, the remains of the two groups slowly melted away, withdrawing into the shadows where they came from without any further words. A relieved sigh left the stranger, and his composure relaxed as he turned around with a wide grin on his face. So guys, have you got a warm and dry place where we can talk? The still-stunned Yahiko only nodded, his mouth slightly open, before he turned around and took the lead. Questions burned the insides of Nagato. He was confused. Curious. But the four of them walked silently toward their hideout. The redhead fixed his gaze on the stranger's back while he casually and cheerfully marched behind Yahiko. Conan slowly opened her mouth to finally break the silence, but without turning around, the stranger simply raised his hand and shook his head. A little bit later, Conan. The Kunoichi's mouth fell open, and she shared a confused glance with Nagato. The small team walked for another half hour in complete silence, each of them buried inside their own thoughts while. The stranger just crooned something cheerfully until they finally reached their hideout carved into the hard stone of a canyon. Suspicious glances followed them as the group passed several curious shinobi and finally settled down into a bigger chamber. The blonde stranger had taken a look around and took out a small paper tag from his pouch. When he channeled a small amount of chakra into the piece of paper, all of them felt like they were submerged underwater. The noises behind the wooden door became numb, and the air ruffled oddly around them. The stranger settled down on one of the chairs. Then, his eyes turned toward Yahiko. An odd curiosity sparkled in his eyes while his golden orbs observed him carefully from head to toe. You can ask now. It was the orange-haired leader who asked the question that had been hovering around everyone's mind. Who are you? The stranger made a wandering face before it moved to several other expressions, ranging from annoyed, impassive, sullen, and ending on surrender. It was like he was having a silent conversation, or most likely a vehement argument, with someone. And he had lost it. In the end, he just shrugged. I had to help you to prevent a chain of events which should never be happening. Dot, and my name is Naruto. Nagato narrowed his eyes, observing the boy in front of him with a mix of curiosity and suspicion. It was the same odd name from Jiraiya's book. It was strange how he said it. It wasn't just a simple introduction. It sounded like he was offering much more wit revealing his name than that. An offering of trust. What events? Conan took a step forward, her eyes mirroring only curiosity. Nagato glanced around. It was strange. Neither Conan's nor Yahiko's eyes showed suspicion. But still, using a name from Jiraiya's book was more than suspicious for him. It was manipulative. The boy didn't answer immediately, his eyes locked on the empty table in front of them before it moved to pierce Nagato's purple irises. The Rinnegan could be a dangerous weapon in the wrong hands. 
The redhead eyed him for a long moment, his brows furrowed. We don't know you. The meeting was kept secret between only the three of us. How did you know about it? Naruto made a face like he was looking for words. Let's just say, we've got a mutual friend who had told me about it. Who? Nagato pushed further. You wouldn't believe me, and it doesn't matter anyway. Naruto shrugged again. Try us. Maybe we will believe it. Yahiko took a step forward to wait his previous words, but the stranger's eyes were still locked on Nagato. Up until now, Naruto's attention was glued on the Rinnegan wielder, despite the fact that Yahiko was the leader of the gang. Let's say it was my sensei, but it would still not be entirely true. A frown appeared on the leader's face. Don't misunderstand me, I'm grateful for your help. You saved both Conan and I. But why should we trust you? You just appeared from nowhere with a false name, with a false appearance, and you ask us to trust in you? Yes. His voice was calm, which stroked their inners like a mother's hand while Naruto slowly straightened himself. Then, suddenly, a sulking expression appeared on his face. And Naruto is my real name. The stranger's muscles tensed, his previous expression hardening. The mood twisted around him, as this time, his eyes were serious. I came here to warn you. Yahiko narrowed his eyes and stepped in front of Naruto, warn about what? The boy closed his eyes, his muscles tensing even more, and the henge slowly dispersed. Yahiko flinched a step back when the golden eyes switched with piercing azure blue orbs. The chestnut hair disappeared, and golden, spiky locks took its place. The flawless skin on his face was replaced with three whisker marks on each of his cheeks. AIM had been isolated for years since the Second Shinobi War, but rumors still reached them, rumors about a fighter with that same golden, spiky hair and piercing cerulean eyes, rumors that told them to run for their lives if they met with a man from Kanoha. You are the Yellow Flash. Naruto tilted his head to the side with a strange expression, then flung his head backwards. His loud and childish laughter filled the room in a blink of a second, and it stayed there for a pregnant minute. When it finally died down and the stranger collected himself, the blonde shook his head and waved a hand to the puzzled leader. Close, but not true. The blonde gathered his expression, his previously childish face moving into a serious look once again. Conan, Nagato and Yahiko, leader of the Akatsuki. If a man in a mask appears with a man who looks like an aloe vera, do not listen to him. Yahiko narrowed his eyes and held out a hand to stop Conan, who already opened her mouth to talk. Why? Because they, because that bastard will dash, the shinobi closed his eyes for a second, a roller coaster of feelings falling from his face. A second later, he shook off his swaying emotions and braced himself. His words echoed confidently. Because you're all seeking real peace. But the peace he will offer is false. Nothing else, just the deceit of reality. If you stand in with him, you will bring destruction to the shinobi world. Oppressive silence fell onto the room by the heavy words. Tension gathered around them, thick and sticky with the promise that if someone tried, the pressure could be palpated with their bare hands. You were talking about Uchiha Madara, Yahiko stated calmly, his voice knifing through the previous silence. Naruto immediately froze, and the blood ran out of his face. In the next second, anger rose inside his chest, bubbling and eating away his mind like acid. Azure blue eyes suddenly glowed in a brilliant crimson color while chakra flames started to flicker on his trembling shoulders, flipping from gold to orange from time to time. His voice boomed inside the room, leaving an odd aura where it connected with the walls to echo back a millisecond later. He is here. He pressed the words out through gritted teeth. Yahiko tilted his head to the side, observing the boy in front of them. He could feel distantly as Conan's body started to tremble with the rhythm of the flipping chakra flames, but she still inched closer to him to position herself between him and the unknown force. Nagato also tensed, 
ready to attack and defend them if he had to. The leader narrowed his eyes and forced his voice to sound as calm as possible in the strain around them. He was, but he left. Naruto growled, and the golden flames slowly started to fade away from his frame. A heavy breath left his mouth. Yahiko narrowed his eyes until they were only slits. That sheer power which appeared just then was unbelievable. It was warm like a sunny day during summer that he had experienced only once in his life when he was just a boy, heartwarming like the sunbeams he had yearned to experience once again in his homeland. But he was also sure in one thing now, if he had wanted them dead, they already would have been. The leader made his decision. He was here a week ago, talked to us about joining our forces, but I refused. Did he say anything about when he'd be coming back? Naruto's voice was strained. Yahiko didn't answer, just watched their new companion for a silent moment before he shook his head. No. The stranger's shoulders slumped. He told me that dash, three heads flung in Nagato's direction, causing the man to flinch back in surprise before he resumed. He told me he'd be waiting for me every day at the same time in the same place. He was really there every day for the next four days. But three days ago, he told me that he'd be back at the end of October. Naruto closed his eyes while covering them with his trembling hand, his anxiety almost seeping from his pores. He desperately shook his head, muttering something under his breath. Then, his head snapped to the side as his harsh voice broke the silence. I know, Karama. Don't lecture me. I know he's preparing for my birth. The blonde boy suddenly stiffened and spread his fingers to sneak a peek at his companions. He offered an embarrassed smile while scratching his cheek childishly, I said that out loud, didn't I? Nagato, take a step closer. What did you mean by that? Eh, nothing. It's a long story. Maybe one day I'll tell you everything. Really? Naruto let out a sigh and ran his hand through his golden locks. He was obviously tired and troubled. I'm sorry. I have to go now. Who are you? Nagato took another step toward Naruto, his purple eyes narrowed and demanding. I already told you, my name is Naruto, he repeated. The redhead only shook his head. No. Who are you really? What is your true purpose here? The blonde teen tilted his head to the side with a wondering look which then turned into a sad smile. It slowly morphed into something else. His gaze hardened, and his electric blue eyes pinned Nagato. To the ground. I am the one who will bring peace. I am the one who'll break the circle of hatred. I am the savior. How arrogant. Yahiko mused silently, his brow furrowing in disapproval. The gang leader's eyes traveled toward the pools of icy blue, and he suddenly recognized the emotion. It wasn't arrogance as he first thought. It was determination with the strength to move mountains. And Yahiko, leader of the Akatsuki, bowed to his determination. The bar was crowded with civilians. People joked, sang, and shouted at each other while the smell of tobacco, cheap sake, and junk food filled the air. Two figures sat next to the counter, one of them slowly slurping his ramen while the other ran his eyes through the crowd, scrutinizing every single man and woman for a short period. A grimace appeared behind the dark mask which had managed to shroud most of his face while leaving only his obsidian eyes and short brown locks visible. After a moment, he also turned back to the counter to lean against his palm. We should have headed back straight to the village, boss. The second man with chestnut hair and similarly colored eyes shrugged and took another slurp from his soup. If there were any shinobi around, he would recognize the thin layer of chakra on their features, the sign of a simple henge to hide their real identities. One of Uzumaki Naruto enjoying his meal and a clone for diversion. I was hungry. Don't complain. The clone with the mask let out a snort, then suddenly stiffened for a moment. If anyone had made a second glance on the man, they would have noticed that the obsidian black eyes morphed into brilliant red while six thick, 
black whisker marks appeared on his cheeks. We should hurry back before they find out that you just left a clone. And the only thing you could think of was your stomach. Again. The brown-haired man simply shrugged once more and ordered a second bowl. Minato won't notice the difference. Even with a Byakugan, they wouldn't be able to realize the difference between me and the clone I left behind Kanoha. I pumped enough chakra to last for three weeks. A scowl appeared on his face suddenly. What do you want? I told you I didn't want to talk for a while. The masked man indifferently shrugged, but his red eyes suddenly widened and flickered to the side for a second. The pool slowly and sneakily wandered to the other end of the pub, locking on the bamboo wall for a second with a puzzled sparkle. Gears turned inside his skull, and finally, an odd, sly grin appeared behind the mask. But his companion wasn't aware as all of his attention was glued on his steaming bowl. Nothing serious. Thinking of trying out some sake. At least we're again in touch with Akatsuki after after so long. The brown-haired man rolled his eyes and continued slurping his soup indifferently. We're running out of time. The brown-haired man finally stopped. It took a long time until he replied in a low tone. I know. The brown-haired man let out a long sigh and put down his chopsticks to stare at the half-eaten ramen in his bowl. The moon's eye plan won't succeed without all of the bijou. You need to get closer to Kushina during the childbirth. Use Minato's trust and strike during the labor. I'm sure he will allow you to be there. You can act as a guard, then strike. That is the only time when we have a chance, and he will be occupied with the childbirth. Red eyes locked on the man in front of him, observing him for a long silent minute until he finally glanced up and opened his mouth to reply. I know. I'll do what needs to be done. Don't let your emotions influence you. This has to be done. Don't try to reason, don't do anything other than strike, your only chance is before he can touch the seal. I know. But Minato, Kushina. He wanted to continue, but he failed. The brown-haired man clenched his hands into fists, his joints becoming white by the restraint. I already screwed up when I had the chance. I'll do it this time. I'll kill him. His voice died down, but not enough to call it a whisper. It was more of a rasp than anything else. Naruto quickly dismissed the clone next to him and dropped the henge as soon he spotted the familiar wooden door of Kanoha in the distance. He was glad that he knew the village like the back of his hand. The crack on the wall, his secret passage from his childhood, was still hidden behind a large bush. He hopped down next to the counter at Ichiraku without anyone noticing his arrival after he switched with and dismissed the clone that had been impersonating him for the last week. His peace wasn't long-lasting though. Within minutes, Naruto felt a hand on his shoulder, and the familiar chakra signature of his sensei filled his senses almost immediately. Can I join you, Toraku? A wide grin appeared on his fine features while he motioned toward the empty seat next to him. The stress and the burden of the upcoming events faded away a little by his company and by his wide smile. What's up, Jiraiya? It's still Jiriasensei for you, brat. Okay, okay. Jiriasensei. So, how's your research pet project going? A grin appeared on the Sanin's face while he settled down next to the teen. Good. I already found a publisher who is interested in my new book. What will be the title? It's Aika Aika Paradise. Naruto only gave a wide grin in response while Tuchi put down a bowl of the steaming, fine food in front of him. How was your last mission? Jiraiya grimaced. Went well, despite a rat. Naruto made a slide glance while he sucked in a big pile of noodles, sending some droplets all over the counter. After one huge gulp, he raised a curious eyebrow while he dug deep into his bowl to fish out his next portion. What rat? It's a long story. When we get some time, I'll tell you about it. Another loud slurp and the roll of noodles was gone. I've got time. 
Naruto happily dug his chopstick into the steaming liquid to fish out a whirling fish cake and another, proper amount soft noodles. The toad Sanin inched closer. He eyed the team for a long moment as he lost himself in his own small word. Just him and his ramen. Jiraiya leaned onto his palm casually. How was the weather in aim? Don't even ask. The cold managed to seep into my bones. Windy, foggy and rainy. Naruto grimaced, but his mouth left open as he artlessly chewed his food. That was. Very Naruto-ish. Congratulations. The fox's voice echoed within his mind, but strangely it didn't seem as satisfied or as smug as when he usually insulted the blonde. Then, Naruto's veins flooded with ice. The chopstick froze in midair while a proper amount of noodles slipped back into the bowl, sending steaming droplets of hot soup everywhere. Another chakra signature appeared from nowhere behind his back. There were a familiar buzzing feeling in his father's seal just milliseconds before. But he didn't dare to even twitch his fingers when a familiar hand grabbed his shoulder. His father's hand, which always tapped him gently, which squeezed his shoulders with care and concern. It was now holding him firmly, the fingers painfully and threateningly digging into his flesh. Naruto's eyes slowly drifted toward his sensei whose warm expression had melted away from his face. The look in Jiraiya's eyes sent a freezing chill down Naruto's spine. What he found there in those eyes made his own azure blue orbs to slip to the side. His once sensei's gaze painfully stabbed the middle of his heart, shook him to the very core. Not even five seconds ago, they were warm and caring, but now. Now, they were looking back at him with a glacial rage. He heard a soft ruffle as his father leaned closed and blonde locks brushed against blonde locks. A second later, he could feel the man's breath on his earlobe before his hissing voice spoke accusingly. The game is over, boy. If you resist, I will kill you with my own hands. Understood? The hair on his neck immediately started to stretch toward the sky as a shiver crawled up his spine. A small, almost unnoticeable nod left Naruto's body while his mind struggled behind two instincts which had been carved deep into every human's core. His mind struggled between the instincts to attack or flee, but in his state, he couldn't decide. In the end, time gave him the answer. He felt a sharp pain where his neck connected with his skull, and he embraced the rush of darkness like an old friend to flee from the situation. We are running out of time. A shadow twitched in a corner, shrouded by a thick bamboo wall. A man in the middle of his forties flung his wide and horrified gaze toward his shoulder where a tiny green toad was hiding beneath his long white locks. His muscles tensed to the point it hurt, and his hands clenched into fists, his knuckles whitened from the strain. Inhuman anger rose from his core. The last shreds of his self-control were just barely restraining. Him from the bloody rampage he so desperately wanted. Disappointment rose above his rage, disappointment in himself, about his own judgment, about his own observation skills. The small green toad had opened its mouth one more time, human voices coming from it. A voice which he had known for almost a year, the voice of a man who he trusted so much he handed over his own life into his hands. There was a long hesitant pause before Jiraiya heard the almost inaudible reply. I know. Jiraiya's blood froze. The moon's eye plan won't succeed without all of the bijou. You need to get closer to Kushina during the childbirth. Use Minato's trust and strike during the labor. I'm sure he will allow you to be there. You can act as a guard, then strike. That is the only time when we have a chance, and he will be occupied with the childbirth. Another pause. I know. I'll do what needs to be done. Don't let your emotions influence you. This has to be done. Don't try to reason, don't do anything other than strike, your only chance is before he can touch the seal. I know. Minato, Kushina. There was a choking sound, I already screwed up when I had the chance. I'll do it this time. I'll kill him. 
The voice died down until it was just the ghost of a whisper. Jiraiya's teeth clenched together with such force that they threatened to crack. How could he have been so naive? So blind? How could he have misjudged this boy so direly? He would bring a new chance for a prophecy. Yeah. A new chance that the prophecy would never be fulfilled with the death of Minato. The toad sage's muscles started to tremble, worry successfully masking his still rising fury that filled his chest. He slowly moved his head to the side and snuck a peek between the lines of the bamboo fence toward the two men at the counter who he bumped into half an hour ago accidentally. He almost missed them. He was occupied with a black-haired brunette behind the curtains of a small bar when a name caught his ears, and a familiar voice forced its way into the bar between the curtains. It was Toraku's voice for sure. The same tone, the same reactions, the same words he was so familiar with. First, he was curious. Why was the blonde boy here? Jiraiya had thought he was assigned on a mission by Minato. But when he spotted the boy wearing an almost perfectly masked henge while walking together with a stranger, he started to have doubts. Stealth and spying were his specialty, so he followed them into the bar and sent a small toad to hide in the shadows of the counter so that he could eavesdrop from a safe distance. What he had heard squeezed his chest painfully. Toraku sought the deaths of Minato and Kushina. After a year since he had shown up. Why? Why he didn't show his real intentions during that period? Why didn't he strike then? He had gotten countless opportunities to kill them over the years, but he didn't. None of it made any sense. Jiraiya narrowed his eyes. They talked about Akatsuki. The same organization he had just received information about from his spy in AIM. They were a growing group, or most likely a gang, who were fighting against Hanzo. They wanted peace, an end to their nation's suffering. Jiraiya shut his eyes and squeezed his hands into fists while his mind raced through the overheard conversation once more. The moon's eye plan won't succeed without all of the bijou. Then the answer revealed itself so ruthlessly that he couldn't help but flinch. The birthed at the seal oh my god. They want the cubi. With this one last thought, the toad sage disappeared from the small pub to head back to his village with speed enough to rival the yellow flash. When Naruto woke, he found himself once again in the empty room with the two-sided mirror. He was secured to the same chair with the same leather shackles, and he could spot several paralysis seals on various, not to mention important, parts of his body. He tried to move, but he couldn't feel his limbs. It was like. It was like they weren't even there. Even his innards were numbing as the suppression seals burned around his torso. He could barely feel his once bottomless power, but the small amount he could still sense restlessly whirled inside him like it couldn't find its proper place in his coils. In his desperation, he considered reaching out for Senjutsu or for Kurama's chakra, but he dismissed the idea in an instant. He didn't intend to do so. At least, not in the near future. He didn't put any effort to pay attention to his surroundings, nor to the room on the other side of the mirror. They would come soon anyway. He could sense his father's and Jiraiya's faint chakra signatures, while Minato's dim scent also lingered in the air around him. Naruto stayed motionless for the next minutes in total silence. However, it could have easily been hours for all he knew. His sense of time was dulled by the numerous seals on his body. His head flung freely onto his chest, his mind surprisingly empty. He was waiting for something to happen or for somebody to show up and start to question him. Finally, he slowly raised his head a little and sneaked a peek between his blonde locks. He spotted a smaller, metal rolling shelf in the corner, similar to one that people would use to serve food. But Naruto doubted there were snacks under the brown sackcloth. He spotted several, ominous dark brown spots at the corner of the fabric, and a cold shiver ran up on his spine to raise the hair on his arms and the back of his neck. He let his head fall back onto his chest and forced down the sudden lump in his throat. He didn't feel weary. He simply felt dead and betrayed. 
He had counted on the fact that that this would happen with time of course, but he thought Minato would first try to speak with him before he made a drastic step like this. And not to mention that he was so curious as to how on earth they know he was in aim. He wasn't even angry at himself. It was still so shocking to him. It was a silly slip. Something only he would do. How could he have answered that question so casually? He didn't even notice the suspicious question. It was so natural. Chatting with Jiraiya and eating ramen made him lower his guard, and the toad sage had played him for a fool. So the words slipped between his lips by instinct. Finally, the door's squealing sound kicked him out from his musings. He slowly lifted his head, only to have enough space between his bangs to catch a glint of the betrayed look on Inoichi's features as the man slowly walked closer to his slumped form. His golden locks hung freely onto his forehead without his high tie, which had probably been removed at the moment they knocked him out. Kanoha would never willingly allow a traitor wear their insignia. He glanced up between his locks once more and lowered his head down again when Inoichi reached the chair next to him. I'm sorry, Naruto mumbled, but Inoichi either didn't hear or simply ignored him. Without a warning or even a word, the interrogator placed his warm palm on his forehead. It would have felt soothing in the suddenly cold room, if Naruto hadn't known what was going to happen next. There was a sudden and painful stab at the back of his head as Inoichi forcefully slammed against the defensive barriers of his mind. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.